and welcome to Positive Parenting. I'm Deanne Conrad, Community Relations Supervisor for the Sioux Falls School District. We thank you for joining us today on Positive Parenting. It is a joint venture between the medical professionals of Sanford Health and the education professionals of the Sioux Falls School District. And our topic today is one that we hear more and more about in our community, the prevalence of diabetes and um, how our students can care uh, for themselves and have a successful day in school um, while they're still very closely monitoring their blood sugars and uh, their illness along the way. So uh, very uh, critical that schools be informed, that uh, students be informed, that parents have all the knowledge they need and that's what we're talking about here today. I have some guests joining us who will help us navigate this conversation. And Rhonda, why don't we start with you, please? Hi, I'm Rhonda Jensen. I'm the diabetes coordinator at Sanford. Um, I work with kids and adults who have diabetes and um, help them navigate the role of having diabetes and, and um, managing their blood sugars. Okay, wonderful. And? I'm Molly Satter and I'm the health services supervisor with the Sioux Falls School District and you're the gal that uh, receives all that information uh, or helps uh, get it to our nurses to make sure that children with diabetes mm -hmm. are, are well cared for. Yes, I, I help, help to coordinate the effort. Right, <laughs> wonderful. Yes. So we, got, we have two wonderful <laughs> coordinators among us today who can help us coordinate this conversation. Um, in terms of diabetes, um, we've been hearing a lot more about it in the last mm -hmm. five, 10 years. Um, Sanford is doing some really fantastic research in terms of diabetes and, and uh, that type of thing. Um, are, are we seeing more cases or are we just uh, more aware? Oh, we're absolutely seeing more cases, both with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And the American Diabetes Association figures that as, as we look at our children now, by the time they're in, the tw in their 20s, one in three will be wow. at risk and will have diabetes. And not just type one, but we're seeing a big increase in type two diabetes with um, the increase in weight and the, and the poor eating habits you could say we've developed as a society. So um, I know this is your world on a daily basis, um, mm -hmm. but for those who, who may not know the difference between type one and type two, can you give a brief description of, of when we say type one diabetes and type two, what are we talking about? When we talk about type 1 and type 2 diabetes, type 1 is where the body com completely quits making insulin. And so we usually see that in young children developing in, in up into about the 20s. Most people develop type 1. When that happens, the only way to treat it is with insulin injections. Type two is a little different because that's really more related to weight gain, um, heredity, and what we see with that is people develop it gradually over time, mm -hmm. and they develop a high blood sugar, and sometimes they can be on medications, sometimes we can have them on diet and exercise only, but um, we're seeing a large increase in type two developing in kids, mm -hmm. and that, it, Type one is on an in, a rise mm -hmm. too, but sure. type two is being um, more common in children than it ever has before. Which says that perhaps we're not making the best choices in terms of, of food selection um, mm -hmm. and maybe that we're not exercising as much as mm -hmm. we should be as well because if that weight gain is you know prevalent a component of type two. Um, are, are we seeing, do, do we have type 2 students in um, the school system? Primarily it's type 1 that, mm -hmm. that we have that I'm familiar with. Um, I think we've had a few um, mm -hmm. over the years that I've been here that have mm -hmm. been type 2, but it's mm -hmm. primarily type 1. Mm -hmm. So explain a little bit about the process for a child mm -hmm. who's been diagnosed um, with type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, obviously that's not just something that um, they think about after three o'clock when they get home from school or before mm -hmm. eight when they go, mm -hmm. um, it's an all day, mm -hmm. every day occurrence where yep. you have to be monitoring that. Correct. And so how do our, how do our schools, how do our nurses um, yeah. care for those kids? Um, so typically the nurse will be informed by the parent that the, the student, um, when they're initially diagnosed, oftentimes are hospitalized. And so we usually get a call saying, you know, my son or daughter has been diagnosed, they're in the hospital. 
um, you know, we'll be returning to school next week, what do we need to do? And so the nurse um, can really walk them through that process. We typically get um, orders from their physician outlining their, di it's usually called a diabetic medical management plan, and it, it very thoroughly outlines when the student needs to test their blood sugars, um, what, their, what their range of blood sugar should be, um, you know, kind of what to do for highs and lows and, you know, their insulin range and that kind of thing. And so um, we get all of those orders pulled together. We work with parents on that, physicians. We um, develop a health care plan for them. Um, and then we, you know, get the student back in school and oftentimes our nurse is the one really helping them through that process of the student themselves mm -hmm. and even the parents, um, you know, the process of what to do, um, when to check your blood sugar, because it's still so very new to them. Can't um, imagine. So mm -hmm. it is a lot of education and, and mm -hmm. our nurses, you know, work with and reach out to the diabetic um, educators in our community and the physicians and it's just a, it's a joint effort. Um, in getting those kids kind of in a routine, so to speak, if there ever is mm -hmm. such a thing, um, but getting all of those things in place to make them safe at school. You say routine. Um, is there a, a typical um, process that a diabetic student, they should you know, check their blood sugar at this time mm -hmm. or that time and that time? Is that, <clears throat> is that typical or is, does that differ for every child based on of other factors? The typical would be to have them check their blood sugar before every meal and at bedtime. Outside of that though, what we see with kids is that sometimes they're checking other times of day and they need to be pretty fluid about when they check. Mm -hmm. They may check before exercise, um, they may need to check after exercise. It just, it, uh, or if they think that their blood sugar is low during the day, they would want to check at that time. So the routine times are before meals and at bedtime, but in addition to that, a lot of our kids do more testing than that. So that um, places <clears throat> a lot of responsibility on a, a child, and we're, we're talking in some cases, you know, we're, we're working mm -hmm. with five-year-olds who have this disease, mm -hmm. and that's a lot of responsibility for a five-year-old to, oh, I think I need to check my blood sugar. Um, how, how do you teach them when the right time is or how to know? And I, I think, you know, all kids are different to mm -hmm. start with. They're all individual, so they all learn at a different pace sure. and, and become able to do those things at a different pace. The other thing, though, is that um, all of them have as we age, our ability to take care of the diabetes themselves changes mm -hmm. over time. So that kindergartner, preschool coming in, it, child coming in may just be able to start helping with the glucose mm -hmm. testing, but may need somebody there to actually poke the finger and mm -hmm. do the test. Um, as they get older, sometimes around the age of about eight, we think they're about ready to start giving and they have the dexterity, the ability to hold an insulin pen to give their own injections. So it is, as far as independence and developing that, it's a process mm -hmm. it, as they age. Mm -hmm. And then always, we always tell parents and um, the school is very aware that um, just the responsibility mm -hmm. that a child feels along the way where when they get to be teenagers they may feel very confident doing all the skills but they still need that guidance and that right. person kind of looking over their shoulder at home and mom and dad need to be so involved in that diabetes care throughout right. that child's life. Absolutely. So type 1, does that ever um, go away? No, it never does. The body has basically destroyed those cells of the pancreas that make insulin. And do and we know why? Well, it's an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So it's really that the body has attacked itself mm -hmm. and has destroyed those cells and it, they won't regenerate. A lot of the research that's being done is looking at regeneration. Can we regrow those cells? Is there a way to preserve the cells that are left and then later point regrow them. Right. Uh, Interesting. Again, part of the research mm -hmm. I'm sure that is ongoing. Ongoing. Yeah. Yep. So so a student has diabetes, they need to do a regular check. Um, are they doing this on their own or they I've seen 
before where they're they're in the office. They mm -hmm. come to the office and they do their tech and such. <coughs> but what's what's typical in terms of a student in a school? Um, well, each student is different, and it really we rely on the physician and the parent to kind of help us, and the nurse's assessment of the situation to decide mm -hmm. is this student capable? Mm -hmm. um, are they ready to do this on their own? And sure. typically, we have a doctor's order that says yes. In fact, the students. Um, capable of self-administration, um, and then that would lead us to kind of move in that direction. Otherwise, we we would have our nurse overseeing um, that student and potentially giving their insulin if they weren't to that point, and then once they were able to give the insulin, then just observing the student, um, mm -hmm. kind of walking them through, counting their carbs, um, you know, figuring out how much insulin to give, and then observing them giving the, the shot. So, um, you know, it's a variety of, of ways from actually administering observing um, and then we have students you know who are quite a bit older you know high school age who are very independent and, and completely mm -hmm. managing that on their own and it's so much like the teacher process uh, mm -hmm. you know you have 25 <laughs> yep. students in a classroom yep. and some are you know have the skill down and mm -hmm. they're moving forward and and then there are others who mm -hmm. you know still have building that needs to be done to get that skill mm -hmm. into a to a manageable phase yeah, so definitely. yeah a lot of work that happens and, and uh, our nurses are there but our um, our clerical also do Absolutely. a significant amount of this as well we have our um, many of our clerical staff are medication administration trained and so uh, we are able to um, sometimes have the nurse over the phone kind of manage that and have the clerical observing the student um, giving their insulin and so it might be a joint effort between the clerical and the nurse to say, the nurse to say you need X amount of units or units of insulin, mm -hmm. and so then the clerical can observe the student dialing the pen up, can confirm that it's at sure. two units, and then the student actually self-administers that. And so, so yes, yeah, sometimes they're involved in that process. They can um, certainly observe the student checking their blood sugar, and um, are trained to know, you know, what the student's range is, range. so we can identify if they're low and can provide them a snack if that's needed. And again, we have those care plans in the school that direct the care on that. So yes, they're involved in, in many ways. And, and that amount of insulin needed um, would, would vary on a number of factors. What else is kind of going on in the body, what they've had mm -hmm. previously to eat? Yep, it those kinds of things. you know, it varies based on what they're going to eat, what their blood sugar currently is at that time, and sometimes it can vary based on what activity they're going to be doing next. Are they going to PE or what's happening um, may mean that we, we vary that dose, giving mm -hmm. more or less. Mm -hmm. That's a lot to remember. <laughs> it's and a lot to, go ahead, I'm it's sorry. It's a lot of math. Yeah. So a lot of For anybody lot who of thinks kids. that math is not, you know, useful. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> you Ab better hope you're never diagnosed with diabetes, right? <laughs> Absolutely. It is a lot of math for kids. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's even a lot of math for nursing. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, as mm -hmm. a nurse, I find sometimes it's, wow, this is a lot Complex. of math. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing I like math, yeah. but not many yeah. people do. Right. So. Well, and I joke about this, but this is serious stuff. I mean, uh -huh. it, it really is down to the point mm -hmm. for, you know, this and that, whatever the mm -hmm. numbers are, you have to be, you have to be knowledgeable about what that means. Yeah. And, and that can Absolutely. be a life and death situation, mm -hmm. yeah. knowing that specifically. So learn your math, people. <laughs> 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 um, but along the way, even with these, these, um, details and the complexity of this illness, um, there's a lot of technology out there that has has come um, just in the recent years. I am familiar with um, a student who is, I think she might even be graduating this year, um, but previously, you know, it would have been a challenge for her to be an active student, um, you know, and she is a dancer and wears a pump and it's you know she's just managed it and it's um, wonderful to see and this equipment has really done great things. Well for technology has taken us a long way in diabetes it really has been wonderful. Um, I think back in the years I've worked in diabetes and when we first started putting kids on pumps and they had to do the math themselves and mm -hmm. figure out their dose and program that into the pump and as we all know kids are great at pushing buttons and <laughs> Better than adults things. most Absolutely. times. Absolutely. <laughs> so they could get that, but it was still the math piece. 
Now the insulin pumps that kids wear actually do the math for them, which has been fantastic. Right. So for those of us who don't like math, it's great yeah. to have an insulin pump. But sure. that's a new piece of technology that we're seeing prescribed more and more in pediatrics. Mm -hmm. But not everybody would be a candidate for a pump, or is it, again, just kind of a... You know, it kind of depends upon the parents. Pumps are expensive. Mm -hmm. It is not a... Um, inexpensive piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. It's a very expensive process to have an insulin pump, but we're seeing more and more of our pediatric patients have those. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine, Molly, you're seeing more in mm -hmm. school. Absolutely. I, I would just venture to say about half of our students mm -hmm. have pumps versus mm -hmm. insulin pens, and we see it more and more. Yep. Yes. Now are they are they still required to push the button when they need the the pump, or does the mm -hmm. pump know, does the technology know that mm -mm. blood sugar's low and need No, to the technology isn't there yet to, to do what we call a closed loop system where mm -hmm. it would read the blood sugar and give the insulin according just like the pancreas. It's not there yet. Um, what the student still has to program in their blood sugar, they have to put in how much carb they ate, so they still have to do some of those okay. other things and um, some of that math, and then the pump can determine the dose, Okay. and then the student has to agree that that is the correct dose and give that insulin. So there is are quite a few button pushes and sure. quite a bit of yeah. information you have to give the pump in order to get a response. Right. But we all know those kids are better at Oh, yeah, analogy. <laughs> <laughs> then we are. Um, in terms of the um, care that goes in, uh, uh, and I think I mentioned it earlier, it's not, you don't think about it at one day on Wednesdays I do this mm -hmm. or, or whatever, which is that ongoing management. Mm -hmm. um, is I know we have a lot of illnesses that we care for in the school district mm -hmm. and a lot of just day-to-day -day needs. Is are the numbers of diabetic students uh, more prevalent than any other care that we do, or is it, is it just one, uh, uh, another big slice of the huge pie that uh, you guys? <laughs> I'd say it's tackle. another big slice. I, um, you know, it's definitely a big part. If a if a student has diabetes, it, it does it does take some nursing time to oversee and manage that definitely um, but we have a variety of other um, chronic illnesses that um, students have that also require that kind of management day -day as well but um, definitely it is one that that does re require nurse oversight um, mm -hmm. to make sure that the student is well taken care of at mm -hmm. school and so yeah that's, never enough nurses that's right you guys are always <laughs> yeah. hopping from place to place and all yes. kinds of, and, and certainly, you know, the reason for that is we want students to be successful and have an uneventful day medically mm -hmm. um, so, so that they can have an eventful day academically. <laughs> and absolutely. those two things have to have to really play nicely mm -hmm. together if we're going to, to make that happen, to make, make sure um, kids have a successful opportunity and a successful environment to be in during yeah. the day. Um, let's talk about the the type two piece a little bit more. I know that um, you know as a community we have had some conversations mm -hmm. about you know our health in general, and that um, some of our kids are reaching those those rates of obesity <laughs> that are challenging and those types of things. Um, what do we need to know um, to get on the path of changing these habits? You know, I think we need to really look at how we eat mm -hmm. and that we are so used to quantities that are too large mm -hmm. and we look at that as normal. Um, I'll take my own home, for mm -hmm. example. When my kids were younger, I would they were really into orange juice. That was mm -hmm. the thing. And from my husband's perspective, that was a very healthy. So when I said, you know, a serving of that is only four ounces and that 12 ounce glass you're filling up is three servings. He was like, but this is a it's healthy good for food. Them. It's mm -hmm. good for them. It's a good food. So I think we have an, a, a kind of warped view of what is a portion of mm -hmm. food and what's an appropriate amount of food mm -hmm. in general. You know, we look, and then we do a lot of things that are very high sugar, we, mm -hmm. and especially in kids. A lot of real pop you know, yeah. pop with sugar in it, um, a lot of those things that really add 
sugar to the, our body that's not beneficial. Right. It mm -hmm. has really no purpose. And so we need to think of more of those fruits and vegetables and getting good healthy nutrition mm -hmm. and getting rid of the, you could say, wasted nutrition mm -hmm. opportunities. Sure. And, and certainly pop is a wasted nutrition opportunity. Um, water is much better. And with the flavored waters <coughs> coming out, I was I'm really happy to see a rise in that and mm -hmm. a decrease in pop yeah. use. That's a great process. The other thing we really need to think about with our kids is exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, we are so much more sedentary than we've ever been. It's mm -hmm. very common for kids to go home at night to maybe sit in front of the TV or be on, uh, you know, playing with their iPad or right. sitting down. Mm -hmm. We really are past the days when we pushed them out the back door and the whole community had a play area and they everybody played in the street and, and right. everybody <laughs> got together and you played. Well, you watched everybody else's kids. If uh -huh. they were near your house, you just yep. assumed responsibility for <laughs> 11 extra bodies that were there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely, and they played and they ran, and um, we've gotten past those days, and we don't really do those activities that really burn the calories mm -hmm. and help our kill kids build muscle and mm -hmm. learn that, learn to you know, do activities that later in life they can keep doing. Mm -hmm. You know, what we're, what our kids are learning is that sitting in front, doing an iPad work or looking at Facebook every night is the activity I do. Mm -hmm. and, and as adults, we're not always good teachers in that. We're not. We're really, you know, um, I think when you look at at our generations coming up, we have really just kind of melded into that sit at home and not do the exercise. And when you turn into adult, you don't pick up the exercise. So we're not good examples. Yeah. And even something as simple as, you know, a family walk around the block mm -hmm. or something like that where, you know, I, I think in, in one respect, I think, yes, we are that family. The kids are, you know, on their phones, they're on their their electronics, they're playing their games. And then in the other respect, I think we are running every single night. Yeah. <laughs> we are going to soccer, we are going to softball, we are doing basketball, mm -hmm. we are doing you know, piano, mm -hmm. we're doing this, we're doing that. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of, I see myself in what you're saying, and I see our family in what you're saying. And yet I think to myself, um, you know, as a child, I never had those mm -hmm. sporting activities, but you're right, I was never at, if I had a free moment, I was at the park with 15 other kids and we were, you know, playing tag on the, sure. the swing set and the other mm -hmm. equipment and, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, it, we have to assess what we're doing. Well, and you're families. so right that, you know, that opportunity for that family walk. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something as kids grow and as we become adults that getting out and walking is something we can still do. Whereas maybe when we were young and we played in the park or we mm -hmm. now play, have kids playing soccer or football, mm -hmm. that's something that probably when they get to be 30 or 40, they're not gonna be still doing. Okay. So really try, <laughs> yeah. trying to get them into activities that, you know, here's something we can do as a family or yeah. here's something that later in life, mm -hmm you might sustain right a bike ride is important Lifelong absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely and we're yeah. in i know in our our physical education courses mm -hmm. and things like that we're focusing a lot more on you know that activity that can be done on a on a regular basis you don't necessarily need mm -hmm. uh equipment right and um you know, trying you, to teach right you don't have to go to a certain location or be in a certain activity or, or be pieces a member of, of a gym right or. that there are a lot of opportunities to get mm -hmm. active and um, you know just out in our environment being in nature alone is mm -hmm. uh, a really good opportunity to just and that intense move. you know <laughs> intense workout I think some people think if, if if I can't go and do an intense workout for 30 minutes what's the point why would mm -hmm. I why would I go? Um, but again, it's just that movement, even, you know, walking up and down the steps, mm -hmm. you know, a number of times or whatever, just, you know, heading, heading to a store, even if you don't need anything and walking around the outside of the, yeah. <laughs> that can be a yeah. jaunt in itself. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. those kinds of things. And, and just trying to teach that to your student, mm -hmm. you know, it's okay to take the, or to your child, um, it's okay to take the stairs. It's okay oh, to but park the escalator at the <laughs> and shields <laughs> is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> but some of those little things are just quick, easy little ways that we can teach kids to be active, you know, and, without and, it and, costing anything or mm -hmm. being a big formal activity, so to speak. Yeah. And those <clears throat> those things 
play a significant role in, in prevention of mm -hmm. In diabetes. keeping us healthy, um, one of the things we're working at at Sanford is we have a diabetes prevention program, and it's run, it's managed through the Center for Disease Control. And really, it shows, you know, the evidence says that in prevention, if we cut back weight by just seven percent, which isn't very much, most mm -hmm. people think they have to lose to. Uh, mm -hmm a really small weight, but 7% and just increase our activity in the day, we can prevent diabetes, which is really exciting. So mm -hmm. you think about that in our young kids. Can we get them more active? Mm -hmm. Can we help them, you know, eat those healthy foods and, and really become more of a um, society of prevention? Mm -hmm. We're gonna prevent our young kids from developing diabetes in their lifetime. Well, certainly a, a disease that has had um, many conversations around it recently and, and hopefully some of the things, some of the research that, that Sanford is working on will allow us to learn more and gosh, maybe one day, um, you know, find a cure for type one and, and we already know what the cure for type two is, it's <laughs> eating healthy and yeah. doing uh, preventative uh, activities and such. So coming up on final thoughts, anything else you would like the community to know about the care of uh, students in our schools with diabetes? Um, well, with diabetes or any other health condition, that it's a joint effort between our school nurses and the parents and the physician. So um, just for those parents who maybe have a newly diagnosed child, um, working with your school nurse and making sure that those lines of communication are open. Um, I, like you had said, um, our goal is to make sure kids are healthy and able to learn and um, and then beyond that, we want to kind of take that health piece out of the equation. So mm -hmm. that's not a focus during the day, and our focus can be on education. So um, that's that's really what, what our goal is for students. Great. Rhonda? Any final you know, I think it's important that parents know that they have the school district to work with mm -hmm. because that is so critical that when I go to work, I can leave mm -hmm. my child and I know that there's a nurse available, there's somebody mm -hmm. available who can really help and manage, help to manage that disease. Mm -hmm. And as Molly said, you know, we really want kids to have that academic experience mm -hmm. and not spend their time because they're ill, maybe in the hospital mm -hmm. or um, not able to go to school because they don't feel well. So it's really important that we manage those blood sugars well. And we need the parents and the school district and the medical professionals all working together to make that happen. Absolutely. It's a complex, mm -hmm. complex disease that really requires all hands on deck. So, mm -hmm. well, thanks for joining us today on uh, positive parenting. This is a topic we wish we didn't have to address, mm -hmm. um, but with the, the prevalence in our community and also uh, the type 2 diabetes with obesity and a variety of other factors that are contributing. Hopefully, you've learned something here today. After you're done watching, turn the TV off, go do something fun take a walk, um, get moving, and make healthy choices on your eating habits. Thanks for joining us.